Hello, welcome back to another episode of the show that you're about to hear. And it is the week end. No, not weekend. It's a Friday. That's when this episode comes out, I hope. Uh, before the World Cup finals. And it is truly something that I have really not given a fuck about this year. And uh, if you're a football fan, I understand your entire excitement. But I, I feel nothing. This is not specific to the football World Cup. Because I'm sure it's made dreams, it's made lives, and it's entertained the fuck out of humanity, which is great. And of course, everyone just forgot about uh, the entire human rights thing that they go on about. Like, uh, suddenly it's like, wait a second, but we're watching football. We talk about this after the football's over, dude. Like, what the hell are you going on about? You're such a party pooper. Like, what the fucking people are being killed? Ah, yeah, it doesn't matter. But it's this whole, this whole thing that we have uh, moments, right, which are highlights in society. It, um, you know, the World Cup in itself is quite fascinating because that idea that everyone in the world is involved in some way is first of all quite arrogant by the people ouch bump my head into the mic i don't know how i got my head around the mic but it was actually the pop-up blocker now uh pop filter not pop-up blocker Why the hell do i say pop-up block that's a computer thing pop filter shit losing the plot between the real world and online uh anyway so the idea that the whole world is going to be interested in this is quite in it's, it's quite a statement in itself right um and yeah, I mean, other things do it, I suppose, like the, you know, World Economic Forum. But I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. I, I don't have this idea fully formed, so bear with me and uh, maybe play along. Is you have a sport which a certain number of people like, and some like playing it, some like watching it, some realize they can't play, some realize they can't watch. Um, now, you then create this league nationally, regionally, and then say the winners of these leagues will represent the country in that sport. I suppose it's fair if you look at it like that. But then when you tell the rest of the people who don't like that sport, you have to watch it or it'll be shoved down your throat. I su- This is for any sport, whether it's... Th- but you don't... I don't know. You don't feel the pressure as much when you as you do when you watch or uh, when the World Cup is around. Um, at least it used to be that way. Uh, and I think maybe this is an Indian thing as well because uh, I was talking to my father-in-law about father and father-in-law, my father-in-law about this. And he says, "Yeah, the World Cup is something which is huge in Europe, and now, of course, in some parts of North America, but also huge in South America, and Africa, and Asia. And but the amount of interest that Indians show towards the World Cup is ridiculous, considering we've never fucking entered or qualified for it. At least I, I don't think we have. But we just love being." obsessed by the world cup like we you see indian guys and girls as well like about uh, i don't know what it is wearing manchester united jerseys wearing barcelona jerseys just like knowing every stat about messi about cristiano ronaldo like literally they can run behind him and go no 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 ronaldo you scored not 90 goals 91 goals bro i know everything about you and the country's not even there so is that strange is what i get and yeah of because other countries if they're not in it uh they don't give a shit. Like, they're like, yeah, we fucking left it. But as long as we have skin in the game. So that's a national involvement in the sport. Uh, but I'm sure there are football fans there as well. But when it comes to the World Cup, it's your country you're backing. And India is strange then in that way. India backs the players. But, um, or rather Indians. Let's not make that mistake. Because then I'll probably get a thing going, India does not stand for football. But fuck that. Um I'm not shitting on the game in any way. I'm just trying to understand a human thing, an Indian thing specifically, about why we're so obsessed with the World Cup or even with the UEFA or whether it's the, the, what do you call that, the Premier League or all the leagues. It just seems to be a thing that we love talking about how much we know more than the next person uh, when it comes to how many more matches we watched, about the stats, about how, you know, this one's kick was much more flamboyant and technical. So... Is it a thing that we do where we love talking about stuff more than actually doing it? Yeah, I think so. Anyhow, um, you think of that in your own time. Actually, 
but don't go anywhere because right now I have a conversation coming up for you, as I always do. Uh, my guest in today's episode is uh, Patricia Villarubia Gomez. She is, well, you'll hear a story of moving from Spain to Sweden to follow um, in the footsteps of researchers and also uh, pursue her, um, well, need to become a better researcher. Uh, we talk about, well, what she studies, plastic and how a product that was initially created and manufactured for some betterment of certain aspects of human life has now become a pandemic in itself and how it is, I'm sounding like one of those news reporters, anyway, um, has become a severe issue for human beings and our environment and more importantly for life on, uh, other life in oceans, on land and clearly where in this case cause the problem but we're going to reap the benefits as well we're going to have it everywhere and yes we do see horrific examples of plastic you, you, you're being uh, plastic nets around octopus or or seals choking on plastic waste or dolphins having uh, asphyxiated or seagulls whatever all horrific sites but it's as dangerous to human beings and we're not aware of it because we don't see it and it's happening on a microscopic level and it's happening in our lungs it's happening in our brains it's happening in our genes so patricia and i have a well a fun <laughs> conversation about plastics and a very informative uh, a set of well informative from her end curious from my end a conversation on your end hey how does that sound so tune in on the other side to my conversation on the Soapy Dao Show with Patricia Villarubia. Yeah, again, I messed up. Patricia Villarubia Gomez. As always, thank you for tuning in. Till the next episode, goodbye. God bless. Take care of yourselves. Cheers. Patricia Villarubia Gomez. I hope I got that right. Welcome to Perfect. the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, let me ask you something. You, we were just talking about this, so I thought we'll take it on air before I get your answer. Now, why would someone uh, with the view of the Mediterranean Sea and also the view of uh, southern Spain leave something like that for cold, cold Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a question that I, that I used to get. And is that I, I am from, as, as we mentioned, I'm from the south of Spain, uh, from Andalusia, uh -huh. and from, from a little city in Malaga called Marbella. And, uh -huh. and the reason why I left to Sweden, why I left Spain to come to Sweden, is because I couldn't develop myself as a researcher, as a scientist uh, in there. Mm. Uh, so, and I needed to learn English. Mm. So when I was 23, I moved to, to Sweden. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, to learn English and to to get a career in as a researcher. So, so yeah, I mean, of course, you know, sometimes people do say English is um, a, a language that levels the playing field, right? In uh, ac across disciplines and especially in certain uh, disciplines more than others. Uh, but besides that, what was your um, approach to getting into the sciences and the discipline that you are in right now from southern Spain and, and growing up in a place like that, it, it sounds almost idyllic, right? So is there a, a need to kind of become what you did? Uh, it, what, what was it? Was it, was it your surroundings that made you feel, I need to do something about it? Uh, was it like the tourists coming and littering or what, what, what were those instances that made you pick the field that you did and we'll get into that right after this yeah so i i think that um my surrounding i i, I come from a very humble family uh, mm -hmm. we have restaurants and we have work and my family has work in hotels mm -hmm. and and other restaurants so like me together with my cousin we were the first two women uh, going to university so oh, nice. for us for us was very much like we have the curiosity and we are changing uh, the gender roles in our family. Mm -hmm. uh, we need more uh, mm -hmm. or something different. And I have always had the curiosity of a child. So when I was a child, I was like really annoying. I was <laughs> asking questions 
all the time and that has not changed right that's awesome uh, yeah. yeah yeah uh but around when i was when i was like four one of my aunties she read a book about environment to to me and my brothers mm-hmm. and that stroke me like how it's it was called like 50 ways in which we can help the environment and but at that time that's the first book i remember uh, consciously yeah. And that have followed me for my entire life. And that's what one of the reasons why I chose to do environmental science. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why finishing my degree, I end up uh, going to volunteer in a conservation camp mm-hmm. in Cabo Verde for marine tar- tar- turtles with the organization right. Cabo, Cabo Verde Natura 2000. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2000. And this was literally on a desertic island. There was like the, very few people lived there and it's very volcanic. So it, it, it's, it's beautiful, but it wasn't like heavily, heavily populated. Right. And the amount of trash that was coming to the, the, the beaches were just insane. Mm. And many of the turtles came with like their fins uh, amputated and they told us that it was because of the fishing gear. Ouch. And to me, that was like the first big uh, call uh, that I needed to do something about it. And then I watched a documentary about plastics uh, by made by Five Gyres Institute mm-hmm. uh, with Marcus Edison and Anna Cummins. And that changed. That changed. It was in the, within like the same year span. And that changed my whole like the whole my whole future so I was like yeah I'm I'm doing this this is something that I need it I feel like the call for for working on this on on this kind of research so I remember growing up plastic was more with the toys right you yeah. would have like the GI Joes or you would have yeah. um, Barbie dolls I mean I, I played with both hey come on and uh, you would have yeah. uh, <laughs> so you would that's have what we have to do that's what we have to do yeah and the strange thing is we never thought of it as plastic toys, right? We just thought of it toys yeah. and it was synonymous as plastic. Uh, but then, you know, uh, because growing up in, in India, the, the concept of microwaves came later. Uh, mm. Heating your food up in a microwave, mm. storing your food overnight or in the fridge. Um, I mean, even till date, a lot of our, um, like now there's a new kind of thing back to cast iron cooking, cooking in cast iron dishes. But mm. a lot of that is still, that it was with us growing up, like it was not an mm. alien thing. But then this idea of bottled water, like mineral water, uh, or also, you know, taking your food in a plastic, like a Tupperware box, or you mm. have these kind of these plastic bags or these plastic uh, pencil boxes. We never thought of it, but it slowly was introduced into our life. And eventually now when I look around, I really have to make an effort to say, I want to take this plastic item out because something from like the clip holder on my mic to the the mouse that I use, everything has some version of plastic. Now, whether it's high grade plastic to single use plastic, that's the question. But how did something like this, uh, I wouldn't say creep up, but become such an integral part of modern day society um and when did it why why wasn't it caught earlier or the harm on the environment or when it comes to either um the pellets being consumed by marine life or even the way the the, the lack of biodegradable nature of this product or the various kinds of plastic so Maybe it's not a question, but it's just like, it seems like now suddenly the talk is all about plastic and how bad it is. But did we have to wait this long? No, actually not. And actually, the the massive production of, of plastics mm-hmm. started around the 50s. They're, they're, they're like plastic were produced before and different kinds of plastics were produced mm-hmm. before. But mass production started right after the Second World War. Mm-hmm. And... and mass again like the mass production started in the 50s and it was more based in europe and the us mostly if i if i understood uh, if i have my my history lessons lessons of plastic uh, good it started in in the us and then mm-hmm. uh, europe as well and it didn't like this single use life this li- single use life plastic uh, lifestyle mm. it started right there because it was like the way that it was featured and and 
it's true as well. It was a way of democratizing the consumption between different kinds of living. Uh, so everyone could afford having a comb uh, for for brushing their hairs or like clothing or mm -hmm. and also it grew it, it came as a as a tool for stopping like using a uh, killing uh, elephants and, and rhinos for instance to get like things for like the materials to do like uh, ivory bowl. keys bowl. yeah yeah exactly exactly right, right. and and cut a cut a from the pack of the turtles so in the beginning it was very much like a democratizing and conservationist tool Hmm. But in the moment that you produce a material that doesn't belong to nature and you cannot manage it properly, it gets out of control. So right. the first, the first scientific uh, science or 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 uh, papers uh, like investigations that we have date already in the sixties, hmm. like. Where, where they found like micro like these pellets, these virgin plastic balls, the virgin plastic in the middle of the ocean in the mm. Sargasso Sea. That happened already in the 60s. So it's been 60 but years. Then, yeah. But then there is like a big stop of research on plastic pollution for almost like three, four decades. And, and for the conversations that I had had with other scientists, uh, it's also in part because in the moment that you started touching up on this plastic pollution um, field, you would start receiving calls saying like, hey, you're a biologist, look into animals, look into plants, don't look into plastics. And so who were these were... calls by? Were they by the research? So it was, yeah, so it, it would be it would be like uh, accor according to what what my colleagues have have told me during interviews where like this the the same universities where they were working but also like corporations will be calling them saying like hey why don't you stop uh, why don't you stop researching about this this is not your concern mm. and it wasn't so it wasn't until plastic was actually very very visual their pollution and their contamination was very visual everywhere. Uh, and on, on the plastic gyres in the middle of the ocean that scientists started uh, getting information about it uh, that so we did get, not take back. So to get to this level of visible pollution, it's it, that means the invisible pollution is crazy. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it and as, as I said before, the production, the production and consumption started majorly in the US and Canada and and Europe. Mm -hmm. And this l single lifestyle started in this like more global north uh, side of the world. And as like India, Southeast Asia, and many other African, uh, many other uh, African countries, they didn't have like this life, this single use lifestyle before until yeah. like a few decades ago. So yeah. it was more like a, a consumption driven imposition. Like now we do this. Uh, I was reading a, an article the other day about a, a, an Indian expert saying like, we didn't have this like uh, until very recently. And we were gonna, we had like the same kind of consumption in the sense like we could take our reusable things to the store and get what we needed for the day. Yeah. But now we don't have that option anymore. We have to buy. On, the only thing we have is these sachets, mm -hmm. like these single-use plastic things for shampoo, yeah. for oils. That wasn't there before. That was something imposed to us. This is what the researchers, the, the experts said. Yeah. Um, so it's like, to me, I'm, I'm still trying to understand how much is driven by people asking for this product and how much is imposed by big corporations wanting to uh, capitalize for like creating needs for products. So this, this is where I am right now because not everyone believes that it's consumers asking for this because before we had other systems. Yeah. No, what I don't understand is why, uh, okay, you mentioned that it's not naturally found, right? Uh, yeah. But having said that, there are other things like you know, when you look at concrete or glass, they aren't naturally found, but they're made out of elements that are processed in some way to create yeah. this uh, material. 
Yeah. But essentially when you say leave a building for 30 years, 100 years, it kind of goes back and is broken down by natural forces to some essence of its basic um, elements. But why is it why is it so why is this material plastic so difficult to um, kind of break down and, and and kind of you know get back to its most uh, things so maybe the material uh, can you just give a little more information on what it is this thing we call plastic so generically but I'm sure it's more complex than just the word right yeah so one of the things that make plastic so such a remark su- such a remarkable materials because it's not only one kind of plastics there yeah. are many different kinds of plastics and that's one of the things that we need to know and understand there's not one kind of plastic there are like 100 different types of plastics if not more yeah and and each plastic product has diff- it's it's created with many different chemicals Mm -hmm. So we know that for creating plastics, we are using more than 10,000 different chemicals from which we know very, very little. Mm -hmm. So this is additives, plasticizer, which help the plastic product have special characteristics, like being have a color, have a like being flexible, being hard. So these chemicals make plastic um, unique, let's say that. Right. And one of these uniqueness is to make them super durable. Mm. And if you make a product that is incredibly durable and that nature cannot cope with it, you are including something that is really, really dangerous for the environment. Yeah. And it will be, it will be, Per, per durable, do you say that? Like it will, it will, it will last for hundreds and like hundreds of years, and it yeah. will not decompose like to their to their raw uh, natural materials. It will, okay. and the, it breaks down into tinier and and tinier pieces, ah. and that creates farther uh, pollution into the ocean. Mm. It's red, like it makes it easier for animals to take it to eat it. And then we eat those animals. So, eh, or mm-hmm. no, go on. Or like these these pieces, depending where they are coming from, because like all our clothes are mainly from plastics. Mm-hmm. All these fibers that every time we touch our our clothes or every time we we wash them, like little pieces of these textiles get into the water or to the atmosphere. So we are breathing little pieces of plastics in our daily lives now and the most densely populated we have uh, cities the higher the charge of microplastics in our in our atmosphere in our air so these we're pretty much a plastic uh (laughs) species now (laughs) in the sense um okay so what does this do to us on a cellular level, if you call, or whatever the basic uh, fundamental levels are, or to yeah. us or to animals or yeah. to organisms? Yeah. Yeah. So at cellular level, uh, research needs to 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 evolve more, and and more research is is needed on this on this sense. But we are getting we are getting uh, more and more uh, information about how plastics in different ways how plastics uh, have an interaction and impact in our bodies and Mm -hmm. animals and ecosystems. So at ecosystem level, for instance, we know, and this is part of what I do for my research, for my PhD, is it's um, investigating and getting to understand how plastics have an impact at at earth system levels, like how plastic have an interaction with the carbon cycle with the uh, nitrous nitrogenous cycle mm. with um, climate change with w- uh, water with like everything that makes the ecosystem work properly mm. how plastics how do we have early evidences that plastic ha- have an impact on that and one of the things that we realize is that plastic have an impact in all of them and 
and mm. and exacerbate the impacts of other environmental pressures, for instance, climate change for producing plastics. Plastics come from oil and gas, yeah. gas natural. And and producing all these fossil fuels create uh, a lot of like uh, greenhouse gas emissions and it have a great impact on climate change, right? Yeah. But not still we are not there talking about how plastics are a big driven force for climate change and they are yeah so they i mean i've smelled people burning plastic bags and that just feels like oh my god that's the most awful thing yeah so so that exactly that that is the what i just explained is how it has an impact on the environment yeah but then like a lot of research is being done right now on how plastics have an impact on people and Plastics and all their chemicals that are bad for our bodies can are can create cancer, uh, can create uh, some some are, are are related to things like Alzheimer's or uh, or um, autism. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are endocrine disruptors, so it changes how your own body uh, how, how to. Speak put it in, a, in an easier way, like relates with the hormones, how the hormones in your body uh, works properly, mm. like in a, in a natural way. So it has a disruption on it. Uh, so like you can see now that like a lot of women are having, and this has to be proven, okay? So so just of like- course. no, we're not gonna get, say this is, get, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, but like there they are, they are correlations, like a lot of women are getting uh, and, um, hypothyroidism like yeah. over ovaries are not working exactly the same there are a lot of miscarriages PCOD and and, and all of these things mm-hmm. yes all of these things are related to the chemicals we have around and many of these chemicals are like fossil fuel based chemicals and many of wow. them are on plastics so i'm not saying that we are completely doomed but yeah. we know that we are beyond which what what we call this safe operating space for humanity. Like we need to yeah. change our ways if we don't yeah. want to, if we don't want to be completely screwed up. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that's the thing with everything we've done to ourselves so far is that we've crossed the threshold. We've come to a place where we pretty much shot ourselves in the foot pen with everything, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> it's almost like if someone is looking at us as a as a TV show, we're like, guys, when are these guys going to realize that they're screwed if they don't do something? And it's still that we're just going on blindly, walking ahead, going, yeah, someone's going to figure it out. But I mean, I, I've spoken to a couple of people in different spaces, like in, in, in to do with the microbiome in the Amazon rainforest and how what, what we're doing mm. to those kind of things mm. or what we're doing with carbon emissions and how we're releasing that. Mm. And to what you are saying, it's like how deaf, blind or whatever the word is mm. our group of people uh, or how much are we being distracted by a certain group of people in this space to think, because, you know, uh, it, where I live in Bangalore, India, there are there are things being done. There are single-use plastic bags being discouraged. There are things, but no one's telling you to you know the, giving you an alternative to a phone that doesn't have plastic in it or your car that doesn't have plastic in it. So, so maybe that's something, right? Now, if I tell someone, what are you doing about this plastic thing, right? And people carry plastic uh, their own steel bottles or steel mm, forks, mm. and that way they don't. And but it's. It's impossible, however plastic, how, however conscious, conscientious you are, there is something plastic, whether it's the car handle, the door handle in your car, or whether it is a, um, you know, the, 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 the chair you sit on at a restaurant. But I'm, I'm saying, then someone would say, what, what do you want me to do? You want me to just go back to the days where we drive horse-drawn carriages? Like, so what is the way you approach this conversation? So I, I I completely agree with what you're what you're saying, and I have experienced it in myself. Mm. Um, I am privileged enough to be able to choose, at to a certain level, yeah. what kind of food I can consume, uh, what kind of lifestyle I can have. Yeah. Um, but I also have to adapt to the reality in the countries where I go and I live. Yeah. Right. So here in Sweden, and I was living in Norway, mm-hmm. absolutely everything is wrapped in plastics. Yeah. Yeah. Like most, like all veggies are wrapped in plastics. So 
even though I did my hardest to not consume food that is wrapped in plastic because those chemicals leach into our food. Uh, yeah, yeah, our yeah. food, uh, I couldn't. So for a, for a period of time, I was like, I refuse to eat anything that comes in plastic. And I got anemia. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was something that I was trying by myself. Like I was, I was like, okay, if I'm going to be telling people that they need to stop using plastic, I will do my best to do that as well. Yeah. And I got a little bit too trapped on it. And I was, I was depriving my body for the nutrients they needed because the whole system, the, the consumption system is all uh, driven by plastic wrapping. So the, even like the people like try their best to not consume single use plastic will have to do so because the system is created. So we do that. Mm. So individuals, yes, we have a big responsibility and we need within our possibilities because not everyone has the privilege to choose, but within our possibilities, avoid as much as we can a uh, single use plastic. Yeah. But things have to change at, at uh, who is producing these plastics, like all the companies that are making sure that plastic wraps everything. Yeah. We need, like, we also need a change coming from them. So we all have a role to play on this, but there has to be willingness to change this and to realize that we are polluting our our planet and ourselves. So when I go tell someone, I'm like, hey man, how, how, I mean, how greedy are you that the evidence is showing that it's killing our oceans, it's killing our forests, it's killing us slowly. And it's killing, okay, maybe you don't care about the whales and the dolphins, or you might not care about, um, you know, the, the seabirds or, but th think about it, in 50 years, your child will have some form of, um, you know, some form of issue because of this thing you're producing. I'm saying, I'm saying if I go to a plastic manufacturer, but he's like, I don't care. I'm not going to be there in 50 years and I want profit. My, I want my margins to be high. How do you get, because a lot of the times until you show them another way, which I mean, when you go tell a poacher, stop poaching, he's like, but what do I do? That's the only way I know how to make money, right? Or that's mm -hmm. the only way I know how to live. How, what is the, 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 the equivalent to a plastic manufacturer? Like, what do you go tell them? Like, they're like, yeah, but I'm hiring 10,000 people. You asked me to fire 10,000 people. They're not going to have a job. How, you, how do you expect me to stop making this? So I'm just playing this scenario out. Yeah, no, for sure, out. for yeah. sure. And, and I think that this is one of the most complicated things. And the reality is that I believe they know how bad the situation is. Yeah. Because information and science is there. And yeah. it's tr it's true that for a very long time, scientists, we have not communicated uh, in the best of our capacities the results that we are getting. Yeah. But in the case of plastic pollution, we have a really, in my opinion, it's like a really great uh, like change in on this. Like they are making an effort to to communicate very clearly what is happening. And it has been happening for a very long time. So I do believe that big corporations and small and small companies, we know. If we want to know, we know what is there. And I don't think that is that difficult to, to understand because like we see plastic all around us. And mm. the problem, and one of the problems that I think is that here in the global north, like Europe and 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 the US and, and Canada and many other like more um, wealthy countries, what we do is that we export most of our waste to countries from like before it was China, but now that changed in 2018 and now it's Southeast Asia. A lot of a lot of a lot of parties, uh, a lot of um, big amounts are getting to Pakistan. I believe India is also there. And now routes are changing and are also going to Latin America and Africa. So mm. we in the global north don't see the problem that much because we ship our waste. We outsource our you mean waste. They somewhere physically else. put their waste in a ship and send it. A hundred percent. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. So when when 
in Europe for a very long time when in Europe we said, we have recycled, like we are the best at recycling. We have been recycling like, I don't know, I'm making this number up right now, but like 50% of our recyclables have been recycled. That mean, that meant that we sent 50% of our recyclables or 48% to another country so they could deal with it. Mm. And then we said like, look at us because we are more sustainable than you. You have to copy our ways. And we blame, we have been blaming other countries to not be waste management, management their, their, their waste properly. But if we send them our waste, what are you expecting? I'm not yeah. saying that, I'm not saying that um, waste management was good in those places before, but it's absolutely horrific right now because we yeah. are sending all our waste and blaming them at the same time. You're sending waste to a country which didn't have a proper system to manage waste in the first place. And now you just have a system that's completely crumbling. Yeah. So so there are many organizations working on this and many, many non-profits working on this. Uh, and... I, I believe like one of my favorites is IPEN and they work a lot on this uh, transboundary movement of, of waste and the chemicals that are polluting those countries. So what you just said before, like, how do I tell to a, a big corporation person um, that in 50 years their kids are going to be sick? Well, if you look into the information we have right now and many of the documentaries that have been um been um, published lately, the story of plastic is a terrific one. I, I please go and watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, they do interviews to little kids saying like, yeah, I went to the doctor because I live close to a place where they burn waste. And the doctor told me that I may, like I'm either, I think that she said like a 60 year old person or I smoke a lot and I'm only 11 or 10 or something like, and all of this is came, it's coming from the burning of of plastic nearby her house. Uh, oh there was on the, on the news the other day, um, like a, a family like birds around are dying, and and they have to move when they're like big burning of the open burn plastics because all those chemicals that are incredibly polluting our, our everything are getting into the atmosphere that and then we breathe obviously we drink the water and all of that keeps going around and around and this information is already out there you know no it's it's quite terrifying how um we're able to kind of while knowing this we kind of just look away you know uh and pretend that it's someone else's problem but you know what i what i what i don't understand is it's why can't a okay let's is there a process in place to undo the the process of making plastic like can we as with human intervention because the human act of creating plastic has led to this is there a way of developing a method or a, or, or, or a technique to kind of leach the plastic out of the environment out of the water and out of its sort of Per, uh, the long-lasting form. So, for in, what what I was saying before about, um, I believe that we're not doomed yet, and mm. we can change our ways. Is because there are many organizations and many companies that and and uh, universities that are really really working hard to find different ways in which create materials that are more sustainable. Uh, more just more friendly to to the environment and that once we have used them they can degrade in a more natural way and the transmission or leakage of chemicals are not uh, as bad uh, but i believe and i believe that right now we are in a very very important uh, history point in which um, there are many as i said like many people are are doing uh, material research but also like at at legislation and policy level, we are like a breaking point right now. And it's just that next week, um, ne yeah, next week or, or in two weeks, the twenty, the 28th of, of December, of mm -hmm. November, sorry, November, mm -hmm. 20th of November, they, they, they will be starting the negotiations for what we call the plastic treaty, where okay. UN 
it's gathering member all member states experts and 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 different organizations and science to see how we can come up with a treaty with a legally binding treaty to make this situation better and within the next two years there will be five different negotiation setups and during the next two years uh, a lot of pe people are like from the whole like all parts from the world are gathering together to make a treaty mm. but that treaty uh, we have an, an incredible opportunity to have it right yeah to have it like effectively uh, effectively um, make uh, an improvement for our situation that we have right now or we can have something that is just less effective and just business as usual so mm -hmm. right now it's a really important time in which we have to learn more and be more communicative and and try to bring more science and different kinds of knowledge and experiences and convince uh, policymakers to to be better and making this treaty more effective because we cannot afford having business as usual anymore we urgently uh, need to change our ways if we don't want to be in an absolute uh, trouble quite soon you know i remember when we were put into lockdown in all our different countries um it seemed like covid was just crazy and but then yeah. a couple of weeks later we all started feeling a little good about looking out the air was cleaner uh, we could see more birds out we could hear more sounds which were natural as opposed to blaring horns or engines diesel engines roaring and then we started hearing stories right like dolphins returning to venice or certain waters which were murky and invisible because of pollution clearing up and nature sort of taking its course without human um, in intervention or human disruption. And then we started going out from the lockdown and then we had to wear masks and PPE kits and get these COVID tests. And then, this, I mean, I, it was, every time I would fly and get off the aircraft, I would be in shock because you have each person with these plastic bags, you have to dump your PPE kit into, the mask, the gloves, these these face shields. And I'm like, oh my God, it's it was, it was, I would feel sick, not like I'm better than anyone. I would have to do the same thing, but mm. what would, I, uh, sorry, yeah. Mm. Uh, now, the question I have or the scenario I just want to play out is if we, uh, I don't say we, but if humans don't do anything at all, what is the, is there a way rather, or what is the way that the environment around us would react and what can a few scenarios play out to be i'm not sure if i'm understanding the question but like well uh, like how when I, we were we didn't do anything we kind of were sitting at home and we saw these I changes am. right yeah. so i'm just saying if we continue as as business as usual as you said which is mm -hmm. apparently not the way to do it but what if mm -hmm. we just continue like the, 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 the like the numb species that we are what if we just continue mm. doing what we're doing what what are some of the scenarios that we can see in the next few years well we can we can see it now that uh the the cop uh, 27 it's it's happening right now and and we have all these scenarios uh created um uh, and and models telling us like if we don't do if we don't change our ways we are not going to get to the 1.5 uh we, we are going to pass beyond the 1.5 uh, uh, celsius to like an increase on our temperature and that it's going to be really bad and we are going to I don't want to say like catastrophic because I don't want to I don't want the people listening to feel like completely overwhelmed and 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 sad because that's not what we have to do uh, but if we don't change our ways things are going to get worse we are going to have more floodings we are going to have more um um fires we are going to have like our air quality is going to go worse and okay. what you were saying what you were saying before about all these uh plastics that we used to have that we were told that we have to use for 
the um, after like during COVID. Like I believe that cer certain things of plastics are very useful and mm. they help, but at the same time, there are some that they are not. Mm. For instance, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make any, any sense because I was forced, for instance, to use gloves to take like food or something. But if you don't know how to use those gloves, it's just like your hands in the sense of like, if you touch your face with the gloves <laughs> and then you touch something else, yeah. It's like gloves are made to be like to be used under certain circumstances. If you don't use them in that circumstance, it doesn't matter. Like yeah. it's just going to be waste. So plastics are a remarkable material and they play a role in our society. Is the way we overproduce them and overuse them that is getting us into the trouble we are in. Yeah. So it's true, it's true that mass. Uh, help but do we need absolutely everything else because we don't yeah so they're like let's keep the things that are really valuable and that are, are really making our lives better yeah and yeah. face out all the single-use plastic that actually don't have a use and one of the examples for instance and in many countries there were like these legislation being put in place for stop using like banning plastic bags, right? Yeah. Yeah. In When COVID came in many places in the US, they were saying like, no, the most like hygienic uh, materials that we can use are the plastic bag because uh, COVID doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't stick to the plastic bags. And then scientists were making, making um, uh, research on this and plastic bag, some some plastics can keep COVID on the surface for longer than other reusable natural materials. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yes, some single-use plastics for the pandemic were useful, yeah. but many of, like, also many of them were imposed to us for economical means and not for protecting our lives. And they were like, is this, this like, scientist denial versus like i want to sell more and i'm i'm like i put on fear on people uh, that you have to use this because otherwise you are going to get covid and like everything related to plastic is safer is not is not like some things are but some things are not so we need to be very clear in what do we need and what needs to be phased out and go back and use reusables. That's the way that many scientists and many uh, other t types of, of knowledge are saying that we is the way to go. Got it. Mm. So a lot of times people are careful, especially people in your field, uh, researchers, scientists are a little careful making statements that they uh, believe might scare or overwhelm the public. But mm. And I've heard this, the 1.5 degree thing, the 1.5 degree Celsius we have to. But, I mean, I'm not trying to put you in a corner and ask you to play out a scenario, but people need to hear it because when they hear stats or when they hear models or graphs, there's no real grasp of what could happen to them. They're like, yeah, you know what? They'll, they'll rationalize it. They'll intellectualize it. They're like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know what? It's, 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 it's not going to look good for humanity. But... But mm. realistically, we can't sit on a graph. We can't escape into a statistic, right? We will face those fumes of plastic bonfires or landfills spilling over or um, having a plague of rats coming, you know, whatever it may be. The, the, the difference between a real world incident and a statistic or a model at the summit is very, very different. So people experiencing blackouts right now, as today as we speak in Southern Australia, or people mm. um, having those massive floods in Pakistan and losing 1 million lives or whatever, the, the, the uh, 1 million livestock. What? So what, I mean, if I tell someone that plastic toothbrush you're using or that 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 set of whatever plastic spoons or the 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 wrapper your Amazon package came in, mm -hmm. what? 
and it's if, if I say to them, if you use that and you don't change your ways and you don't, if you stop ordering in on single use things, we're going to have 1.5 degree. We're not going to meet the thing. And they're like, yeah, I don't care. It's not a realistic impact on my life. But what are some of the realistic impacts? What will we see more and more of? So what, what I can tell you from experience is that conversations and interviews that I have done to people living on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, so for instance, I when I, I was working for an organization in Norway called Grid Arendal, I had the amazing opportunity to go and, and do workshops in the western coast of Africa. Right. And some of the some of the experts come in to tell us like what is the status of plastic pollution in their countries. They were showing us pictures where a uh, small scale like families uh, fishers like uh, which their livelihood was to fish. Yeah. Uh, they would come uh, come back from after like one, two, three days, like one day of work with buckets of what before were was fish so they have like in this case they had like 10 different buckets of of like yeah the 10 different buckets six of them were full of plastics and four of them were full of fish so they when they sorted out so this is this is not happening in the whole world right now but there are spots where this is happening so what they were saying is that they also have to change their lively, like their ways they work and go farther and farther into like farther into the open ocean to get less plastics. So this also put their lives in danger because yeah, yeah. they don't they don't have like in, in their cases, they didn't have like super uh, potent engines that can take them. It's like many of them were were rowing or they, they have a small uh, small engines. And if you're using engines, you also need more fossil fuels. So mm. the cost of going and fishing is going to be bigger for you and you are getting less fish. So you are getting less money for your family. And those fish have plastic in them anyway, so. <laughs> most likely, most. yeah, most likely. So, <laughs> you know, so I was reading me, uh, somewhere, sorry, just uh, to add to that mm-hmm, point, mm-hmm. where these turtles, these baby turtles, which hatched somewhere off the coast of Australia, and apparently yes. for the first week, they were only pooing plastic. Yeah. And I was shocked. I was like, my God, those poor things have no clue what they're eating because they have no idea. They're just feeding on whatever's in the ocean. And that, that their systems were, had no food, no nutrition, just plastic pellets. And they die yeah. because those things don't get any energy to them. But com- coming back to, to what, the, what you just said about yeah. what do I do to, what do I tell to a guy who is using a plastic straw or like uh, purchase something on Amazon and everything is wrapped in plastic. Amazon should not be wrapping everything on plastics. Yeah. 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 Right. I, I, but I, Sometimes I have to use Amazon because I can certain objects I cannot find them anymore in shops. Of course, yeah. I go to shops, I go to shops and it's like, no, we don't sell that. You have to go to Amazon. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. And I have or I have ordered something and for like, I don't know, like a pen a, a pen. Or not a pen, but like just for, a, for as an example, for a very tiny object, it comes like all these super big, a massive, like massive yeah, amount yeah, yeah. of plastic. Yeah. Like do like what what part of my responsibilities is in here because i didn't and sometimes i ask comment please don't wrap in plastic like i don't need this to come in cut like protected in cotton it's just like it's it's a book i don't know yeah you you know like we yeah you don't need your underwear bubble wrapped yeah absolutely exactly (laughs) it's like it's like instead why don't instead of using it why don't you use that Company, I see, I see it perfectly when I go to the grocery store. Brands that what I buy I, again, I try to be not wrapped in plastics because carton and glass and metal are more recyclable and than plastics, and they get more amount of of them get recycled. So I try to use those. Yeah. And many of these brands are shifting. Before I had like I already have like very little option. But like many of the options I had, they are switching to plastics because it's cheaper for them. 
Mm. Like, you know, I remember when you were saying that when I used to live, uh, when I was in college in the US, when you go to mm-hmm. a grocery store and you buy vegetables, right? Like say you're putting potatoes, tomatoes, mm-hmm. onions. And if you just dump them in your basket and take them to the cashier and put them on the on the, on the the conveyor, they get upset because they're like, how do I think you have to put each vegetable in its bag so you can weigh it and you don't, and that way you're made to feel like, oh my God, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, you know? But I don't care, like just weigh it and weigh it all together and charge me, you know, because I'm going to go home and wash it anyway. But there are these things which are also seen as, oh, you don't know what you're doing if you're not putting things in in separate bags, you know? And it's and it's also it's it's also like compulsory that you do this in certain uh, when you go to certain stores. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's like, but why? I don't want the plastic. So even mm. though we consumers try to do our best, the system, the how things are being put in place, are made so you use more plastics. So yeah. yes individuals and consumers we have to do our best but if we want it to be really effective and change the business as usual way of living we need corporations to also come along with us and change their ways because otherwise we're we're not getting anywhere we need less production that's what we need less production to have less consumption Patricia, you know, I think you've really given me a sort of insight into things. Of course, you know, we we are aware of it. We're told about plastic, but you've given me a layer that I was not exposed to. So thank you for that. Um, yes, you've spoken about non, non-government organizations, non-profits that are doing some work. But maybe before we wind up today, can you talk about a couple of positive glimpses in the future, if there are any? And also, uh, you said a lot of countries are exporting their their garbage, but there I I've read and maybe you can talk about this. The processes of recycling, uh, how advanced are they, and do is is that even a possibility for our future? Okay, so I will start with the recycling part, which is a, a little bit more negative than <laughs> what we want it to be, right? Yeah, and, and then I answer the, the rest. So for recycling and recyclability, uh, this like theoretically all plastics or more most plastics are recyclable right but but you have to recycle them like on like making groups a group of like polypropylene one group the the polyethylene another group you have to divide them and then when you have this group you cannot recycle things that are with different colors you have to also divide it into different colors so Recycling is really complicated, and from all the like what the statistics says uh, right now is that from all the plastic that we have produced, most of it like has been landfill, lost in the environment or incinerated, and around a ten percent has been recycled since oh. the fifties. Wow! You know, okay. it's like yeah. it's like a really really small amount has been recycled. So when I see like people saying like, oh, to solve plastic, we need to recycle more. Like, no, we are, we are making the problem with plastics. We are problematizing that wrongly. We are looking yeah. into the end life of the life cycle. We are looking into waste. If we want to solve things, we need to look at the very beginning, which is, which is destruction of fossil fuels and the production of plastics. Recycling can help, yes, but it should be our last, last uh, option. First, we need to look- Put less plastic the pot- into the environment. Exactly, exactly. And, recycl- and, and recycling is important, but it's not, go- it's not what is going to take us out of this problem. Okay. And it's very expensive and it's also very toxic. You know, so it's not it's not the perfect silver bullet that is going. But it is to an solve. option. It is, a, it is an yeah, option. Of yeah. course, it, it is an option, but it's not the option. Yeah. And we need. I think that we should we should like look into different parts before we look into recycling as the as the main thing, like mm. different kind of design, different kind of materials. And now we move to the positive side, and is that there is like so many people really putting an effort on this 
And like, I'm, sometimes I feel overwhelmed on, with happiness of seeing how people around the world are getting together, like citizen, normal citizen, not, not scientists, not like they are getting together to create and build community to ask for change and to bring, to do their own like citizen science mm -hmm. and uh, and collect data from their neighborhoods and they put it together. And like one of the organizations that, well, it's not an organization, it's a movement. Yeah. Uh, it's called Break Free from Plastics and they produce a lot of information and they are really, really making a dent in history as a social movement bringing information and taking corporations and policymakers accountable for changing their ways. Because we scientists can do a lot, but everyone can do a lot. And I see that and it's it's really inspiring. And youth, youth is doing like amazing work uh, because sometimes I, I have the impression that they understand more yeah. than the grown-ups of yeah. what is at stake and and yeah so like that those are really positive things and and i think that also another positive thing at, at the science level which is where i move uh, around and is that a lot of scientists are also changing the traditional way in which they are doing science i see at least with the people i surround myself i see different kinds of knowledge coming into place i see a lot of like also language uh, justice in the sense of like, as we were saying, like the first things you, you said in the, in the beginning, like everything like is in English and speaking English is a, a level like, like rising your plane, your, your level playing field, right? Yeah. Like not everyone speaks English. I didn't speak English until I was 23. Mm -hmm. I moved to another country to be able to learn it properly. So when I speak, I want I want to communicate also in Spanish because yeah. like a lot of people in Spain don't speak Sp uh, English yeah. and a lot of people in France don't speak fr uh, English yeah. English so I see like that is also coming to a change uh, right. in with, within the communications of science and I think that that's really good and that's what really we really need we need to learn how to communicate with different people and not just like scientists like i love that you you invited me thank you very much because like you you reach people that normally would not read about this other like like think about this otherwise so i'm very glad that you give me a platform to to share what i know no it's been absolutely enlightening uh yes a little disheartening but at the same time I'm these sorry. kind of issues no i don't think it's um a thing that needs to be hidden because you are the person who's giving the information in its most factual way. You're not pushing an agenda. You're not a company that's trying to undermine someone who's making it. It's not. It's not a political thing. It's a fact-based thing. And thank you. you no, know, I, I, I want people listening to know that there is a difference between you know joining a campaign on social media, which of course is great to do, and it's the, each person's. That I'm not. As I said, I don't preach. I don't patronize anyone. The the thing is that these things that you've mentioned, of course, you know, it's the reality is what it is, you know, there's no point trying to sugarcoat it and say, you know what, yeah, there may not be even a silver lining in any of these situations. But fortunately, you said there are people who are taking it in their in, into into their lives and making an effort. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share the information that you've spent uh, time collecting, studying, uh, disseminating, and I appreciate you coming here and doing that today. And um, also for the work you are doing, because people like you uh, do encourage us to sort of come along on the journey. So I appreciate it, Patricia. No, thank you very much. Uh, really, thank you very much. Thank you. Do stay in touch. And if people want to follow the work you do um, presently, I, I think I, I was reading that you're a part of a panel and you're part of a, a committee. So where can they follow your work and track you? So right now I'm in Twitter, but I'm moving to Mastodon. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm learning how to how to do the transition, right? Right. Uh, so right now on Twitter is Pati Villarrubia with P A T E Villarrubia, uh -huh. which is a very long uh, V E double L R A double R U B E A. Uh -huh. um, but if you put Patricia Villarrubia online, you will you will find uh, easily, I think, because my name is Trisha Villarubia. So yeah, yeah, it's quite, yeah. it's quite a uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but thank you, thank you very much. And sorry, I ha I have to say that I I know that you are a comedian, mm -hmm. and it's for me it's, it's very hard to to mix or to do a mix of my personal life with my work life because I'm from a place in in Spain that we our motto is like I need to wake up today and make someone laugh. Uh -huh. So I'm a very jokey person. I'm like a clown in my personal life. Um, right. And like I research about all these super, um, super like sad things. Uh -huh. and I don't know how to how to integrate these these things. So I really appreciate that there is people like you doing comedy because it's really really needed and more in times where uh, where times are getting sadder and sadder. So thank you very much for for doing your bit as well. Hey, it's my pleasure. I, I I think you would say something different after coming for one of my shows. You're like, please don't do comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I won't. But like, well, if I, uh, you live in, in India, right? Yes, I live in Bangalore, yes. Yeah, so if I'm ever there, maybe I yes, can Yes, do hit me and, up. It'd be lovely to, show. yeah, it'll yeah. be lovely to meet and to share um, uh, an evening and hopefully you can come for a show and we can continue the plastic uh, the plastic conversation. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you very much, Sandeep. Cheers, Patricia. Appreciate nice, it. Good luck. Have a nice time. Ciao, Thank ciao. you. Bye.